Welcome to the Leadership Roundtable, a podcast with Dr. Conway Edwards. And today I'm your host, Matt Anderson from One Community Church. And we are extremely grateful that you're taking time out today to invest in your leadership, um, in your church, and even more importantly, personally. We want to thank you for joining in with us. And we have a special guest today. It's Dr. Tim Muehlhoff. You're in for a treat today as we dive in to some of the things Dr. Muehlhoff's been talking about and his most recent book called Defending Your Marriage. So, Dr. Tim, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great. It's Welcome great to, be to here. Texas. Thank you. I've been here a couple of times at the Gaylord. Very doing nice. Doing a marriage conference at the Gaylord. And this is very similar to the weather in California, right? Uh, we've been crazy hot. We've been oh, hot okay. in California, so yeah. So we are tracking together. You are, you are. So Dr. Muehlhoff is here. He's a professor at Biola University, which I learned today stands for the Biblical Institute of Los Angeles. Yes, we've been around 108 years. Wow. That's great. And what do you do there? What, what do you teach? So I teach uh, in the communication department, so stuff like uh, family communication, conflict resolution, apologetics, gender, which is super timely. So yeah, wow. great classes, get to kick around some really important issues. Wow. And the most recent thing you've been working on is a book called Defending Your Marriage. The Reality of Spiritual Battle is the complete title. Wow. And I find with my students, if you were to ask my students who all come from good Christian backgrounds, when's the last time you heard a sermon on spiritual battle? Mm -hmm. The average answer in my surveys was zero. Oh, wow. I, I can't remember the last time anybody talked about the devil or Satan or anything like that, which mm -hmm. is just crazy. It's crazy because 25% of everything Jesus said had to do with spiritual battle. Wow. Every New Testament writer mentions spiritual battle. John goes so far as to say the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And yet we, for some reason in the West, mm -hmm. we're afraid to talk about it. it it's really bizarre. I've, I've, I think it's from the art of war where it's said that one of the biggest tricks of the enemy is to is to help is is to make you think you're not in war. Yes. Yes. Remember remember Genesis where the serpent is described as being crafty? Right. Crafty in Hebrew means subtle. Okay. So I think we get confused because Peter tells us Satan is a roaring lion mm -hmm. seeking to devour people. But don't confuse what Peter's trying to do with what, how Satan attacks. Like I think Peter was just trying to get our attention. Think of the most vicious animal he could think of. Right. But don't assume that Satan's going to roar every time he attacks us. I, I think in the West, he loves to be very subtle in how he, how he attacks us through cultural trends, um, misdirects, uh, making Satan a cartoon character in pop culture really helps uh, him hide behind the cartoonery of how we kind of think of Satan. And we've heard, we, we, we say it as leaders that, hey, we have a target on our back. Our marriages have a target on our back. But the reality is, is for the leader listening in today, we say that, but how much do we act like we right. believe it? Right. And I think that's why you wrote this book. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I belong to Biola. I've been on faculty for 15 years. I have to sign a doctrinal statement every single year. One element of that doctrinal statement is, do you believe in the literal Satan? Which my answer would have been yes. But then ask me, do you parent differently because of the reality of Satan? The answer would be no. Mm -hmm. Do you do marriage differently? I'd say no. Do you even do how you do your classroom differently? And I would have said, no, not really. And so then you have to ask the question, do you really believe in Satan? Functional. Wow. And the book came about because I experienced two really dramatic encounters with spiritual battle. That uh, one was in a hotel room I, I speak at marriage conferences across the country. And, and think of all the hotel rooms I've been in and nothing has happened spiritual battle-wise. But three years ago, I was in a hotel room. I turn off the lights and Matt, there's a presence above me breathing. Wow. Now, you, if you knew me, I, I minimalize the supernatural too much. That's just my default button. Okay. I just tend to think that probably wasn't a miracle. I don't want to overreact. Right. But Matt, I'm telling you, there's something breathing over me. So I turn on the light because I think I've dozed off. Mm -hmm. This is just a dream. But now I'm fully awake, but I'm still going to go to sleep. So I turn off the light again, and it's there. So I turn on the light again. I call my friend, a New Testament professor at Biola, and I, I say what's happening. He says, Tim, this is a spiritual battle. You need to pray warfare prayers. So Matt, I'm walking around the hotel room making up warfare <laughs> prayers. Like, in the name of Jehovah, in the name of Jesus, I command you. 
And all I can tell you, I slept with every light on. And in the morning, it was like somebody had teletransported me from a smoker's room to a non-smoker's room. The presence was gone. Now, here's the misdirect I write about in the book, Defending Your Marriage. Satan's only done that twice. Demons have only done that twice in all the time that I've been a Christian. I became a Christian when I was 13. Mm -hmm. Now, why would he do that? I think because he wants me to think that's what spiritual battle right. looks like and feels like. Thus, I'm not under spiritual battle today because right. I've not experienced anything dramatic. I think he throws in a misdirect every once in a while mm -hmm. to get you to think that's what it feels like but, and not recognize all the really subtle ways he's trying to undermine my marriage, my being a professor, my being a parent. Mm, so what are some of the ways that... <laughs> It's a total misdirection so many times. What are some of the ways subtly that you see Satan slipping in to do damage to our marriage and our relationships? Yeah, so let me give a broad answer and a very specific answer. Okay. The broad one is we have to think, what did John mean when he said the whole world lies in the power of the evil one? I think what it means in part is Satan loves to traffic in big ideas, like cultural shifts. Mm -hmm. So we can think of the sexual revolution of the 60s. Right. We can think of Hollywood's over-romanticizing of marriage and love. Um, over-romanticizing what sexual fulfillment looks like. So when I get married to my wife, I get married in a context, a cultural context. Mm -hmm. Like It could be the divorce culture. Yep. Um, it could be that when you get married, you get totally fulfilled. So all Satan is trying to do is set me up for disappointment in marriage. Uh, and then I'll try to find a spouse that actually can fulfill that fantasy because this spouse isn't doing it. Right. And how many times is that going to work? Yeah. Well, people try it a ton. <laughs> all the time. Right. So I think there's big trafficking of ideas that we have to be very careful about. Let me, let me use one that just shocks my students. Listen, I don't think technology is from the devil, but you better believe he uses technology. Right. So today, it, remember Dallas Willard just passed away, one of the great Christian thinkers on spiritual formation. He's very famous for saying the number one spiritual discipline to start with is solitude, is meditation. Mm -hmm. So biblical meditation is I'm fully present with the Lord. I'm not distracted. Well, Satan, he can read just as much as you and I can. So he knows what Dallas Willard said. So let's create an environment via technology where I'm never alone with my thoughts. I'm always perpetually distracted. Oh, wow. And he just got at solitude mm -hmm. using modern technology, using an iPhone to do it. Mm -hmm. So again, he doesn't care what it is. I think he uses raw material. So anything he can do to distract us from our first love, he'll use. That could be a cell phone. Wow, that just rocked my world. Right? I know. It's so, like totally flipped what solitude with God and now solitude with technology or an iPhone. Well, so talk about flip. I have a flip phone. Uh, I just made the choice not to have a smartphone. Now, I have a, I have a computer right. that can launch missiles, right? <laughs> this is a state-of-the-art computer, but I have to go to the computer. Okay. I, I'm, the kind, I'm a huge sports fan. So, um, and I'm from Detroit, which is a life of pain and oh, sorrow. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's horrible. It's <laughs> terrible. And you're in Cowboys world here. Yeah, and I hate the Cowboys. I don't mean to offend anybody, <laughs> no, but okay. I hate the fact that they win on Thanksgiving. And our family tradition is we have Thanksgiving dinner and then we watch Detroit. the Lions lose. Right. That's our tradition. But listen, so sports could do that, mm -hmm. right? He doesn't care what it is. If you're getting your eye off your first love, he'll, he'll use anything to do it. Um, so I, I, I think that's a big answer to your question. Let me give you a very specific one. So for the book, I read 20 books on spiritual battle from Christian authors. And I asked the question, were there signs of demonic activity that all 20 mentioned? Now there could be some that were mentioned, but not by everybody. Mm -hmm. So I came up with my power five that were mentioned by all 20 Christian authors on oh, spiritual wow. battle. And so very quickly, here's the power five in no particular order. Okay. Though Charles Kraft would ar argue that one of them should be the number one. So first one is anger. Now, anger in and of itself isn't demonic. I mean, there's righteous anger, mm -hmm. right? We probably should be more angry at the condition of the world than we are. Right. But this is anger towards a person that I cannot let go of. 
I mean, you go to bed angry, you wake up angry. Uh, remember, Paul even likens this to spiritual battle when he's not embarrassed to say, do not let the sun go down in your anger as to give the devil a foothold. Mm-hmm. And we know in foothold in Greek means opportunity. Mm-hmm. So if I'm really angry at a person and I can't let it go, I walk into church, I see that person, I walk out the other exit, <laughs> right? Right. Yes. So anger that is consuming me, mm-hmm. and we know that chronic anger from a psychological perspective has a ton of neurological effects. Uh, so my anger is an opportunity for Satan to get a, a foothold of some kind in my life. So I need to I need to deal with that anger before the Lord. And I, it might start out like justifiable anger. You wronged me. You slandered me. You whatever. But when it consumes me is when I've given the devil a foothold. Gotcha. Uh, the second one is catastrophic thinking. Uh, in other words, I don't take a step of faith because I think of all the ways it could backfire. So let's say I want to give, right? I want to give more money to church. We want to, you know, we want to increase what we give, but right. we immediately think, well, what happens if, if there's a downturn in the economy? Uh, we could be ruined. Or my son wants to go on a missions trip. And I think of all the bad things that could happen on that missions trip and say no. So catastrophic thinking is I always imagine the worst, and that governs my thinking. Now, it's okay to be prudent, right? There's reasons why it might not be best for your son to go to this particular place in the world at this particular time. That's just not a wise decision. The catastrophic thinking is I always envision the work. Uh, I can't have an argument with my spouse because I imagine it will ruin the marriage. Oh, That's wow. catastrophic thinking. Yes. Third on the list is I no longer believe the best about God. There was a time that I believed the best about God. I believed that God was in my corner. Mm -hmm. He answered prayer. But for whatever reason, one big disappointment or a thousand little disappointments is I no longer believe the best about God. He's not in our corner. Prayer doesn't work. And it actually makes things worse when I pray, right? Uh, Fourth, I no longer believe the best about myself. Like it's okay for me to say I could be a better husband. But if I start to think I'm the worst husband in the world, that, that is Satan trying to traffic in that area of me thinking the worst. Now, mm-hmm. the fifth one is what Charles Kraft, who's written 20 books alone on spiritual <laughs> okay. battle, uh, he says unforgiveness is the number one way that Satan gets a foothold in the life of believers, is I simply will not forgive you. Mm-hmm. And I think of every justifiable reason why you don't deserve forgiveness. Right. And we know Paul's writings is very clear. Take the forgiveness Christ has given you and give it to other people indiscriminately. It's a process to forgive, but this comes, there comes a point where I will not forgive you. Mm-hmm. So those five are what I call my power five. There were other ones mentioned, but not everybody mentioned them. These were the five everybody mentioned. So in my life, if I'm angry at a person, I, I need to stop long enough to say, wait a minute, is there, there's something fueling this. Mm-hmm. And I need to address the spiritual aspect as well as the psychological interpersonal aspect. But before I wrote the book, my antennas never went up in that direction. I never thought, gotcha. oh my gosh, this is, these thoughts are being placed in my mind by a demon, and I need to rebuke the demon. That felt so bizarre to me mm-hmm. to do that. But now I, I do it. My wife and I do it. Um, people at Biola University, there's a strong contingent um, that are saying, we need to fight the spiritual battle. Wow. Because it really sounds like, as I'm hearing you unpack this, that what... What happens is, is we're by our habits, our actions, we're inviting, we're inviting spiritual battle. Right. We're saying, let's go. Come on. Right. By what I'm doing, I'm inviting it in instead of hitting it right away and figure out what's causing that. It was so funny, Matt. Some people would say to me, "Oh, I don't want to read your book because I don't want to open that door." And I'm like, "Listen, it's happening. It's already there. Already. This is just uncovering." Remember. Uh, the New Testament writers seem to say the first place to start is understand the schemes of the devil. Mm-hmm. And I think Satan loves the fact that we have no idea what his schemes are. Mm-hmm. We have no idea what he did in Genesis. How did he go after the first human couple? Right. And he's been learning ever since. So we need to understand how does Satan blow apart a marriage? Mm-hmm. Um, what does it actually look like on a day-to-day basis? Now, notice with Adam and Eve, he didn't walk up to Eve and say, rebel against God. 
that was a direct attack, mm-hmm. she would have rebuffed it. Right. Um, Satan does misdirect. He does. Uh, he he says to Eve, "Did God really say this?" Right. So he wants to question God's goodness before he can get Eve to go against God. Mm-hmm. And I think we ha- our antennas need to come up and again, not overreact. Right. Not every problem is spiritual in nature, but Satan will use any opportunity he can find. Wow. So um, unpack some more of this book, some of how we actually defend our marriage. We've talked a little bit about the Power Five and how spiritual warfare is right there. What are we doing if, if we realize I'm in the middle of a battle? Yeah. I, my eyes are now open. This was going on. I'm in the middle. I see a target on me. What do I do now? How do I, where do I go? Who do I talk to? What do I do? So here, let me give you an illustration I used in the book. So I'm not a Mr. Fix-It kind of guy. Uh-huh. I was a theater major. My wife was a business major. She was pre-law. I was pre-unemployment. Okay. So she loves to fix things, but every once in a while wants me to fix things because her love language is actually acts of service which I think is demonic. Uh, that is just horrible. Why can't I give you gifts? Why can't I, why can't I not buy your affection? I think that would yes. be beautiful. So our faucet was leaking, mm-hmm. a slow drip, and my wife had said to me, honey, can you look at it? I mean, easy for her to say, for me, that's like you know climbing Mount Everest. But I never got to it. Now we are leaving for LAX because we're going to go speak at a marriage conference. Noreen opens the cabinet, just put something away, and this small little leak now has become a, tr- a pretty strong trickle, but we've got to go to LAX. And so now we're going to have to leave this. And so we're driving to go speak at a marriage conference, and there is dead silence in that car. Now, here's one way that Satan can actually do a really powerful misdirect. If I said to my wife at that point, honey, you know what this really is? This is spiritual battle. No, Noreen would look at me and say, no, it's the pipe. And you didn't do it when I asked you to do it. See what I mean? We can use spiritual battle to say, oh, honey, this is actually just spiritual battle. Right. No, no, no. I was neglectful Mm -hmm. and I should have done it, didn't. And so now Satan wants to step in and say, oh, love this. Let's get angry at each other as we go speak at a marriage conference. So one thing I need to say to Noreen is I do think Satan is stirring this up, but I gave him plenty to stir with. So I'm sorry. (laughs) That's totally my bad. I should have done that. And will you forgive me? But hey, let's not give the devil an opportunity here. He wants to stir this up. And we are going to go minister to people at a marriage conference. So that's the kind of, let's uh, name it. Let's say, I I think something else is happening here. But hey, but it's also because we've been so busy lately, we've not dealt with our own junk. That's giving him raw material. Uh, Kraft says, the way you get rid of rats is you stop leaving crumbs everywhere. We have to make sure in a marriage or a Christian organization, church, university, how much crumbs are we giving the rats to live off of? We need to deal with the crumbs. Wow. <laughs> you just got me thinking about yeah, what, I know what we do to, right. to cause it. And we like to say, if we do take it to that extreme, it was the devil. Yeah. The devil made me do it. Yeah. But what ammo did, <laughs> what bait did I leave out for him? Absolutely. Uh, And and he's a powerful observer. He's Mm -hmm. not omnipresent. Mm -hmm. And one thing interesting in the book is I had to wrestle with the issue, can Satan read your mind? Mm -hmm. The answer is no. He's not omniscient. But there's plenty of biblical evidence that demons can plant thoughts in your mind. Okay. Uh, Where we get that from is very quickly David. In the Old Testament, uh, Satan... uh, uh, tempts him to take a census of his of his army. Now, there's nothing wrong with a king knowing troop strength, mm-hmm. but we learn from Second Chronicles that he had put his confidence in his army, not the Lord. Mm-hmm. So Satan enticed him to do that. Even Jesus had thoughts planted. Remember in Jerusalem, Satan takes him up to a mountaintop and says, I can give you all the kingdoms of the world. Well, from that mountaintop, you cannot see all the kingdoms of the world. So people believe that he did a panoramic view of human kingdoms in Jesus's mind. Mm -hmm. Jesus, interesting, Matt, that he doesn't say to him, no, you can't give me the kingdoms. He just says, no, I'm going to get the kingdoms, but I'll do it my way. So so we have to be careful with these thoughts. I think that's why Paul says, take every thought captive. Mm -hmm. And to analyze every thought, I think it's important to have a criteria by which to identify what thoughts could be coming from a demonic source. Oh, wow. Wow. (laughs) Which is wild to think, right? (laughs) 
<laughs> these reoccurring thoughts. Yeah. I'm, I'm even thinking of, I, we went through an exercise in seminary where we read the screw tape letters mm. and we just tried to analyze if we were going to take ourselves down, how would we do it? Oh, that's great. And you just have me thinking if I was going to take my marriage down, how would I attack myself? Yeah. But then, it, but then are there even more things that he would do? Yeah. Satan that I don't even know yeah. he would do. And he's just been studying and he knows tendencies in me that I don't even know. So that's kind of a fun part of the book is the <laughs> very last chapter is uh, the screw tape letters. I, I just take the screw tape letters that pertain to marriage mm -hmm. and then just discuss those. But I, yeah, I love the screw tape letters. Gosh. Yeah. I don't know why my mind went there. Yeah. yeah let me mention uh, how I think spiritual attack looks. So I became a Christian through karate. That's actually how I, I never okay. went to church. I've became, never heard that before. Oh, oh, yeah. I became a Christian through Michael Crane's Karate for Christ. Okay. I love that. Jiu-Jitsu for Jesus. I love that. So I became a Christian at 13 through karate, but then gave it up, played high school football and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I always wanted to go back and get my black belt. So right now I am uh, going to test for my black belt at the end of August. Wow. I've been studying it for six years, uh, Shaolin Kung Fu. So when you spar the black belts... It's full contact. We do full contact. We don't wear padding. You have to strike with an open hand to the head, mm -hmm. but it is full contact. So my, the first time I, I fought a black belt, I imagined it would be really dramatic. Mm -hmm. Like he'd just come right at me with a, a, a double jump kick. Here's what he did. I'll never forget it. He kicks my leg. And I think, what was that? It was nothing. So we're sparring, kicks it again. I, think, I said, it's like being nibbled to death by a duck, right? This is nothing. Then he kicks me right behind the knee and it caused me a little bit of pain, but I was totally fine. Mm -hmm. Then he faked the kick, just faked it. And I looked down and he hit me with a left hook, put me on my keister. <laughs> well, that, I think that's how Satan works wow. is I'm giving you three kicks and then the left hook is coming. So w when you mentioned that, I thought of that yeah. because it's like, I think it's great for a couple mm -hmm. to think, what are the three kicks he's doing because the left hook is coming? And it could be anything, overcommitment at work, uh, over-devotion to the kids, over the marriage. Mm -hmm. It could be technology. It could be overcommitment to church. It could be mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. But what are the three kicks that are setting up the left hook? I think it'd be great for a couple to say, okay, what is that? Wow. What would that look like? Yeah. What are the three kicks? What are the three kicks? And the left hook could be nowhere in proximity. Unrelated. Well, the more... So we, when you fight black belts, nothing gets through immediately. If he would have thrown the left hook first, mm -hmm. I would have blocked it. We blocked that 50 million times. Right. So your first punch never gets through with a black belt. Mm -hmm. it's gonna, you have to set it up. Mm -hmm. It's two, three moves in the, ahead mm -hmm. that's going to hopefully get through. Mm -hmm. So what is it about my personality where Satan could get me, and then what is it about our marriage that he could get our marriage? So I do a whole mm -hmm. chapter on the armor of God, but I take it from the perspective of how does a couple get dressed in mm -hmm. the armor of God? Uh, because if my spouse is getting dressed in the armor, but I'm not, I've weakened her. Mm. When Paul uses a Roman soldier as his illustration, the thing that made Rome so great, and everybody knew this, was they fought as a unit. They never deviated from fighting as a fighting unit. So I think when Paul picks a Roman soldier, I think, in, I think people would have known inherently no mm -hmm. Roman soldier fights wow. by himself. So me and my spouse. <laughs> and then Eric Wooten, I just heard, give a great sermon on you can't have a healthy marriage without community. Man, right. I was amen and like crazy. Yes. Because I think our greatest protection against Satan is community. Wow. Without a doubt. So how, what is, oh gosh, um, what direction to go? Um, what does it look like then if somebody's listening in and they may think they, they're they suited up or vice versa, mm. they may not be suited up and their spouse is, yeah. what, what vulnerabilities does that have? What do they start to do? How do they right that wrong? Because I never looked at that as fighting as a unit till you said that yeah. and the vulnerabilities. Well, I teach a class on Christian relationships. It's a really fun class. I teach it with a psychologist and a theologian and our wives. It's awesome. <clears throat> One illustration I do with my students is I, uh, I tie, as if they're doing a three-legged race, mm -hmm. they just take another person and I tie the middle legs together. I said, okay, now go walk. 
and you know everybody's falling and tripping i said well that's marriage mm. listen so your spouse isn't you're having an off year they're having a, they're going through a tough tough time mm -hmm. you're stuck you you cannot walk forward without your spouse and so that spiritual battle is I'm only as good as the person my leg is tied to. Mm -hmm. So we need to sit down and have some really good conversations about, hey, how are we doing together? But how am I doing? Mm -hmm. And this is where I take a bit of a, a little bit of a different take on the armor of God. It's a little bit debated when Paul talks about the armor of God. Is he simply being redundant, talking about the same thing, but using different pieces of armor? Or is he actually talking about different things? So let me give you what I'm thinking of. So the very first thing he starts with is the belt of truth. Mm -hmm. Now, does he mean biblical truth, theological truth? Sure, but or does he mean truth telling? Literal truth telling. Mm -hmm. okay. I think it's truth telling because late earlier he has already said put off falsehood. So again, when we talk about the helmet of salvation, we're talking theological truth breastplate of righteousness is he just talking about the doctrine of righteousness or is he talking about right living a, a lot of theologians say when he, when he says the belt of truth he's talking about do you tell the truth to your spouse or do you spin the truth are you always giving these half truths right uh breastplate of righteousness people like kenneth weist a greek new scholar says that's right living so again am i preaching one thing right. as a pastor but my life does not reflect it whatsoever you just gave Satan a wonderful opportunity to split your church and split your marriage because you're not living rightly. Mm -hmm. That's where community comes in. Uh, I have a friend of mine. My computer is hooked up to Covenant Eyes. Mm -hmm. It's this program where he gets a readout every single week of every place that I've gone on the internet. Mm -hmm. Noreen knows that, my wife, and she takes great comfort in that. So if I didn't have that, yeah. oh my gosh, my dad was addicted to pornography his entire adult life. Mm. Um, I have to have huge boundaries. And so I need, I, I would not have a computer without right. Covenant Eyes. Right. I just think it's a colossal mistake and it's, a, it's just a matter of time before things pop up or I go in directions I just shouldn't go in. Wow. The battle is real. Needs to be fought in community. Yeah. Um, and taken seriously, I guess. Taken seriously, it doesn't dominate our thinking, mm -hmm. but it needs to be part of the equation. I think mm -hmm. that's what would shock Paul today. I think he'd be like, so how can, how can you talk about marital conflict and not bring up the spiritual attack? Did you not read my letters? Mm -hmm. So I, I think New Testament writers would be really surprised about the West. Mm -hmm. Now in other parts of the world, it's much more overt. Right. I did relief work in Kenya and uh, Simon Zera Makinga, before we, we would leave the compound, would pray w spiritual warfare prayers. It sounded really bizarre, mm -hmm. but in the West, because I, I think this has to do with the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. right? The Enlightenment was our intellect right. is what made us special. And so anything of like demons and hobgoblins was anti-Enlightenment. So now I'll take a look at Europe, mm -hmm. which is very much rooted in enlightenment and postmodern thinking is they would laugh at the idea of a literal Satan like mm -hmm. that. That's, that's, that's an affront mm -hmm. to my intellect. Mm -hmm. And I think Satan loved that. Wow. What, um, what would you say to church leaders, pastors, leaders listening in, um, any just closing thoughts you'd give them about defending their marriages and the importance of that? Uh, I would say, I was an interim teaching pastor for a year at, at a church in California. Just bring the topic up mm -hmm. and don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay to bring it up and to say, it sure seems like Jesus took this seriously. And it sure seems like each of the New Testament writers talk about this. We need to talk about it. Now, right. it, it, are there excesses? Yeah, we could take this too far. I, I don't think we're in danger of that. because. Right. You know, but yeah, so I just want you to know that your pastor takes this seriously. Mm. And I think that needs to be reflected in our church. Now, what that looks like, we're going to have to hammer out in the months ahead. Right. But we are going to take spiritual battles seriously in this church because the New Testament does. Wow. So what that looks like, we're going to work out. You're going to literally see it being worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, but I I'd make it a topic of 
of conversation. And just get it out there. Start I'd talking. get it out there and not have all the answers. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're going to get objections. We like to have all the answers. Oh, <laughs> we do. We do. But I think it's good to be in process. Mm-hmm. I think the problem of evil is one that we're in process with. Like, right. I don't know. I don't know where God is um, when you hear all these mass shootings. Mm-hmm. I don't have all the answers to that. And I don't know what sovereignty means. I'm working that out. Mm-hmm. I think it's good for a pastor to say the problem of evil has been around since the history of the church. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult issue. Mm-hmm. And so I just want you to know that we're wrestling with this at this church, especially mm-hmm. when it happens in our community, right? I mean, think about Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. Think about tragedies that ha- are happening close to home. Mm-hmm. It used to be that we were exempt from this in the United States, right. but now it sure seems like we're not. To be in process with people is good. It's right here. It's right here, and it's tra- it's tragic. It's not. Right? It doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. No, it's getting worse. And and what uh, my students, the age of the internet, mm-hmm. they don't just see what's happening here. If they want to, they can see what's happening in the entire world. Instant. And there is tragedy after tragedy after tragedy that is happening all across the world. And after a while, you just start to think. Lord, what, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Why would you not intervene in more overt ways? Mm-hmm. And, and again, we're back to Job. Right. Right? Oh, so, yeah, but... So let me just say that I'll end with this, Matt. We know from research, Barna research, we are losing more young evangelicals at a faster rate than ever before. Right. And they're calling it quits. For two reasons, they're calling it quits. One, we're not answering their question. Mm-hmm. They have the internet they see how crappy the world is. Right. And we want to say God's good, powerful, and present. And they're like, it doesn't, make, it doesn't make sense to me anymore. Second, they see the lack of the compassion of the church towards the gay community, the transgender mm-hmm. community, and they're done with it. And they don't want anything to do with the culture wars anymore. Mm-hmm. We're done. So if you, want, if you want to demonize people, we're done. We're leaving. And we're losing a whole new generation mm-hmm. Because we're not seriously addressing their concerns. And I think Satan is using that to lure them away from the church mm-hmm. because, it, listen, you're not being real with us. Right. And so I think it's good for a pastor to get up sometimes and say, listen, I don't know what to say about what just happened in Las Vegas. It is it's tragic. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what to say. Let's lament. Right. Right. I think we've lost the ability to lament. Uh, so again, I, I think to be open to say, I don't have all the answers because the Bible doesn't close all the doors. It leaves some things shockingly unanswered. Wow. And so I, th- I think that kind of honesty students are really looking for. Mm, that's yeah. huge. Well, thank you so much oh, my pleasure. for hanging out with us today. Um, it's been it's been eye opening. And I want to encourage you, um, if you've if you've really enjoyed this, you can follow Dr. Tim Muehlhoff more on his website, timmuehlhoff.com. And also he's got a podcast of his own called The Art of Relationships. Yes. So you want to go check that out and you can just kind of peek in more about what he's passionate about and what he's been sharing. And we'll have everything we've talked about, including these websites and podcasts on our show notes. You can download those at visit1cc.com slash leadership roundtable. Again, we want you to know we're so grateful that you took time out to join us and invest in what God's doing in your life and in your church or in your organization. And if this has been helpful to you, it'd be helpful to us if you'd go out there and leave us a review or give us a rating wherever you listen to this podcast. And again, we just want to say thank you and we look forward to seeing you again next month. Bye.